with uh, orthopedics and neurosurgery. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, sports medicine trained and I specialize in complex shoulder, hip, and knee surgery, uh, which uh, ranges from minimally invasive arthroscopic surgery to uh, large reconstructive procedures such as shoulder replacement or complex instability uh, um, procedures as well. Uh, also, the um, uh, bringing hip arthroscopy to the group here, uh, and um, the uh, currently the only hip arthroscopist in uh, Summit County. Uh, on top of that, I do do the full gamut of knee surgery as well. So uh, feel free to uh, reach out to the clinic here uh, if you uh, would like to schedule up. And if you are having any shoulder pain or feel that maybe a candidate for any of these procedures, feel free to say so in our chat box and we can uh, reach out through the clinic and uh, get you into the clinic here. Um, just a little background on myself. Uh, I grew up in Austin, Texas and I uh, did my medical school and uh, undergrad at uh, the University of Texas and uh, uh, performed my residency in uh, University of Miami out in Florida and uh, then did my fellowship just down the road over at the Stedman Clinic. Uh, and uh, really excited to be out here and uh, um, living in Summit County and working both between Summit and Vail here. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, shoulder dysfunction. I've really uh, kind of narrowed it in a little more to uh, range of motion loss and pain. Uh, I do have an upcoming web webinar in a month, which will deal a little more with uh, uh, the typical athletic injuries that you may see during ski season. Um, so, so shoulder pain uh, has a large variety of causes and in general is not an isolated symptom. Uh, typically, um, depending on the condition, may be associated with stiffness, uh, which is generally considered to be the loss of passive range of motion, uh, or muscular weakness. And this generally presents as uh, a frank weakness and then loss of active range of motion, where the shoulder can still be ranged passively, but uh, with your own active firing of the muscles, you're not able to uh, elevate or rotate the shoulder as you normally would be able to. Uh, also, uh, mechanical symptoms are not uncommon. Uh, there's a variety of different uh, descriptors for these, but clicking, popping, grinding, uh, any of the above can be asymptomatic, but sometimes painful clicking, popping, grinding are due to uh, mechanical derangement within the joint. Uh, similarly, uh, the keystone of orthopedics is returning people to function. So uh, in general, loss of function, in, inability to perform high level activities such as paddle sports, golf, uh, shoulder dependent sports, or just the activities of daily living, getting a can off the shelf, doing your bra strap, uh, doing your belt buckle, uh, those sort of things. Uh, similarly, uh, any good diagnosis is based on the physical exam. So uh, one thing we do look for, sensory changes or any indicators that this may be coming from uh, the cervical spine rather than the shoulder. Uh, this would be uh, basically a pinched nerve and uh, that actual a uh, mechanical derangement of the shoulder may not be to blame, but rather uh, compression of the uh, cervical spine masquerading as a shoulder issue. Uh, so these are all things we check uh, when seeing somebody for shoulder pain. Uh, common causes of shoulder pain, I've really focused kind of more on the uh, intra-articular or in the joint issues of shoulder pain. Uh, rotator cuff tears, probably the workhorse of all shoulder pathology. Uh, this uh, is a spectrum that I'll get into here a little later, but uh, there is where the rotator cuff tendons live, uh, something called the subacromial bursa. You can see this on the uh, attached picture here as the blue um, uh, <laughs> figure there. And uh, a bursa is generally like an airbag that allows smooth gliding of tendons. This can become inflamed with uh, chronic overuse type injuries or after a trauma where there's a large inflammation in the joint. Uh, similarly, biceps pathology, although we normally think about our biceps near the elbow, uh, where you can kind of feel uh, your biceps tense up, 
the biceps actually travels through the shoulder joint and uh, is a common uh, source of pain, uh, whether it's on its own or in combination with other pathologies in the shoulder, be it labral pathology or rotator cuff pathology. Um, cartilage lesions, uh, so uh, cartilage is a smooth bearing surface of the joint and allows a painless motion of the shoulder. Uh, there can be focal cartilage lesions, which are normally secondary to trauma, uh, or generalized uh, cartilage pathology, which is arthritis. Um, and uh, <clears throat> labral tears, very common in the young population, especially after instability events, which are dislocations of the shoulder. Uh, also, these can be attritional tears uh, that can be symptomatic, but there are a large amount of asymptomatic labral tears that occur as we age, uh, which is why it's important not just to focus on an MRI, uh, but actually really uh, the history of the patient and uh, physical exam, uh, ruling out some of these red herrings that we may see on some of the imaging studies. Uh, outside of the joint, uh, and I really haven't focused on this today because I believe Dr. Dorff is uh, presenting on this soon, is uh, AC joint pathology. This can be degenerative, which is normally due to a little arthritis at the AC joint, or it can be traumatic. And this is what people know is a shoulder separation where the AC joint pops up after a direct impact to the shoulder. Range of motion loss of the shoulder similarly uh, has very similar associations, but range of motion loss generally indicates a true intraarticular or capsular derangement of the shoulder. Uh, normally this would not be coming from elsewhere in the body like the spine. Um, but similarly, pain, weakness, mechanical symptoms, all very common with loss of shoulder range of motion. And depending on the etiology of uh, uh, the loss of range of motion and pain, uh, really determines the associated symptoms. Uh, one thing uh, that is sometimes missed is a history of a dislocation uh, without treatment. You can have a locked dislocation that results in a loss of range of motion, shoulder dysfunction, and pain. Um, so uh, the real um, common causes for loss of shoulder motion are tears of the rotator cuff, which normally present as weakness and loss of active range of motion. Uh, nerve impingement similarly can present very similarly to a rotator cuff tear. Uh, this is because the nerves that innervate the rotator cuff uh, drive the rotator cuff function. So if there is a large cyst around the shoulder joint that is pressing on these nerves, it may present with frank weakness and a loss of the active range of motion whereas an examiner may still be able to get you up and elevate you or rotate you, uh, you're not able to do so on your own. Uh, loss of passive range of motion uh, in uh, people in their 50s or uh, those with other comorbidities may be due to frozen shoulder. Uh, this is an inflammatory thickening of the shoulder capsule that it uh, causes a significant pain on its onset. And then as the pain recedes, uh, results in
second. I, just, I don't have my PowerPoint on there. Um, Sorry, guys, bear with us for one second. We're having an internet issue. There we go. Let's see if we can this one. Okay. Okay, we back here. All right. A little excitement there. Okay. Uh, so arthritis is where I've focused a lot of the presentation here today on. Uh, arthritis can do uh, be secondary to what we call just run-of-the-mill general osteoarthritis, uh, just uh, wear and tear degeneration of the joint, or arthritis may be more specifically due to a rotator cuff tear. Uh, this is known as rotator cuff arthropathy, and uh, this arthritis establishes itself as an irreparable rotator cuff tear occurs and results in wearing away of that smooth, nice cartilage surface of the joint. Uh, so rotator cuff tears are responsible for shoulder, uh, sorry, rotator cuff musculature is responsible for shoulder motion and uh, tr uh, tears are generally caused by overuse but also can be caused uh, by acute trauma. Um, as said, these do result in active range of motion loss, uh, weakness uh, and pain inability to perform uh, certain activities. Passive range of shoulder motion is normally due to kind of locking in of the shoulder joint. That occurs when we lose the um, normal bearing surface of the joint, as in with arthritis, or due to tightness of the joint capsule, which also occurs in arthritic change, but may occur as an isolated event with something such as frozen shoulder. Um, these are generally, again, limited with the examiner not being able to lift the shoulder beyond a certain point that is about equal with what uh, the patient's able to do with their own musculature. Um, so the first line of treatment, as for most uh, ortho orthopedic conditions, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, and steroid or biologic injections. Uh, not true for uh, everything, but uh, is generally a mainstay of treatment uh, starting out for most of these conditions. Uh, so uh, getting into a little more specifics here. Uh, so biceps tendon pain, I, again, it's very common, normally coexists with some other pathology in the shoulder, although it can exist on its own. Uh, this pain is normally anterior in the shoulder and can actually be palpated that you can rub your finger over your shoulder joint and kind of bowstring that biceps tendon. Uh, it's kind of tender in me, uh, so it's normally a little tender, uh, but uh, in general, see a patient kind of jump off the table uh, when you're having some involvement of the biceps tendon. Uh, also, this is generally associated with motion, uh, a motion such as screwing in a screwdriver, this is what we call supination when you're turning the palm up, or other rotations. The biceps, the main supinator of the wrist. Uh, of course, elbow flexion uh, can provoke this pain as well. Uh, furthermore, you can have a little bit of mechanical symptoms of, depending on the sort of biceps tendon lesion that is present. You uh, may, may notice some clicking in the anterior shoulder with range of motion as the biceps tendon flips over this subscapularis tendon here uh, where there's a small bony prominence there and the biceps can lose its um, covering essentially and then flip over that tendon there causing wear and tear of the biceps tendon as well as that uh, subscapularis tendon. Uh, so biceps tendon pathology normally ranges, ranges from inflammation of the tendon and the tendon sheath. This is known as tendonitis. Uh, there may be no frank disruptions in the tendon. It may just be very inflamed. Uh, Next step down the line is partial thickness tearing or subluxation. Uh, this is, as it sounds, a non-full thickness tear of the biceps tendon, but fraying of the biceps tendon and possible instability of the biceps tendon over 
its home, which is the bicipital groove. Uh, <clears throat> and then this can progress to a complete rupture. Uh, this is normally associated with a small deformity in the uh, biceps region known as a Popeye deformity. And uh, uh, normally some weakness with that supination movement as well as elbow flexion. Uh, frequently a complete rupture may result in a resolution of pain as we'll get to in a second here, this is actually a treatment for biceps tendon pathology. Uh, and again, normally these are associated with some form of ro rotator cuff pathology, that the groove for the biceps is composed of the subscapularis, which is the front rotator cuff muscle in the shoulder, and the supraspinatus, which is the roof of the home for the biceps tendon. So these are called bice biceps tendon pulley lesions. And as that biceps tendon gets inflamed and is moving abnormally within its groove there, uh, it can cause some tearing of the adjacent rotator cuff. Also, the biceps tendon attaches to the labrum. Um, <clears throat> we've got a little shoulder model here, which isn't entirely uh, anatomic, but the Biceps tendon is shown here coming up into the joint. And that attachment to the labrum can avulse, causing what's called a slap lesion. Uh, this is uh, a labral detachment due to the pull of that biceps tendon there. Um, and so the treatment for these conditions, uh, if the biceps tendon involvement is, uh, again, generally uh, conservative to start. Uh, physical therapy, uh, ibuprofen or naproxen, and uh, possible steroid injections, whether it's into the shoulder joint itself or into the biceps tendon sheath in the front. Surgical treatment, uh, not a procedure I generally perform is a tenotomy. That's just cutting out the biceps tendon and letting it fly. And you can see that here on the uh, image on my left that uh, the biceps tendon, the disease portion is removed from the joint uh, and you're taking out this very tortuous angle that the biceps tendon has to take around the humeral head and then just letting that biceps tendon drop. Uh, my preference is to perform a biceps tenodesis. Uh, here, that disease portion of the biceps tendon is removed, similar to how it's done with the tenotomy. However, we reattach the biceps tendon into the proximal arm bone, the humerus, uh, to reestablish the length tension relationship of the normal biceps. This prevents any cosmetic deformity and prevents any of the symptoms that we see with tenotomies, which are normally uh, some cramping with repetitive motions and some decrease in strength. Uh, also, whenever we're treating the biceps, uh, we place the arthroscope into the shoulder, get a good look at the rotator cuff, the labrum, and make sure that we're addressing any associated pathology there as there frequently is uh, some other um, condition within the shoulder. Uh, so rotator cuff pain uh, generally presents, it may present a, in a, with a couple different patterns of pain, but most commonly is pain radiating down the arm. And uh, generally uh, this pain may awaken people from sleep. Uh, <clears throat> and pain is normally associated with motion, but can be constant as well. Uh, these tears uh, may be associated with frank weakness or some very subtle weakness that is only picked up on an exam. Uh, rotator cuff tears commonly are insidious uh, in nature that it's a degenerative condition. Uh, the rotator cuff wears out a little bit and then a tear starts to form and propagate. However, we do see acute rotator cuff tears after trauma. This is normally after a dislocation event in a, a patient in their 50s or, or older when that rotator cuff has become a little compromised and a little weaker and may tear uh, with an acute trauma. However, we do see it after um, kind of a straw that bo broke the camel's back type setting. Uh, lifting a heavy object in an abnormal pos position, feel a pop, and then the rotator cuff tendon has avulsed off. So uh, similarly to the biceps tendon, uh, there's a spectrum of pathology here uh, that ranges from inflammation, and that's not only inflammation of the tendon, but the inflammation of the bursal sac that lives above the tendon there. Uh, this can be actually pretty ex exquisitely painful, 
but is generally well managed with physical therapy and an injection. Uh, partial thickness tearing, uh, the management is dependent upon the size of the tear. Uh, that commonly, uh, once we enter the shoulder after having properly non-operatively managed a partial thickness tear, uh, we see uh, that the tear is larger than the MRI had told us. Uh, and then this necessitates a small repair, uh, restoring the integrity of the tendon and replacing the footprint of that tendon back where it belongs so it can heal back down with a robust repair. Uh, full thickness tear uh, is exactly as it sounds and is actually what's featured on this uh, picture over here to my left that uh, it's a complete avulsion of the tendon from its footprint uh, that uh, has resulted in complete disruption of that muscular tendinous unit. And th this is really what results in a lot of weakness uh, and um, generally necessitates a repair in order to restore function. Uh, lastly, there are irreparable tears or tears that coexist with arthritis. Uh, the uh, irreparable tears, as they sound, are normally not repairable and uh, we have to do salvage procedures for these. And a tear with arthritis is normally something we treat with a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, which I'll get to here in a second. Um, so uh, just a couple photos here showing uh, rotator cuff tendon management. So uh, first line of treatment for rotator cuff tears, normally conservative. However, an acute tear, we do know outcomes are better if it's addressed quickly. Uh, so in those, we normally don't waste time with any conservative management. We go straight to surgery so that we can get that tendon back onto bone before it retracts and maybe becomes an irreparable tear or results in some uh, greater dysfunction than uh, would be present if we had acutely addressed it. Um, <clears throat> so surgical treatment, debridement is normally limited to partial thickness tears. And that's only used if the uh, integrity of the tendon is primarily intact. Uh, repair is the most common thing for a rotator cuff tear. Uh, superior capsular reconstruction, so repair is shown above. You can see the tear in the tendon with what we call a double row repair here, which is a very robust repair that allows uh, the best chance of healing for a rotator cuff tendon. Superior capsular reconstruction is uh, for an irreparable rotator cuff tear. The tendon has avulsed and then retracted well beyond where it can successfully be re repaired without over tightening the shoulder. Uh, this, we use what's called uh, allograft, which is tissue from a, a human cadaver, uh, and that is implanted and repaired to the remaining rotator cuff, and this prevents uh, the humeral head or the arm bone from abnormal elevation within the socket that occurs with a irreparable rotator cuff repair. This is a salvage procedure, and uh, in general, these patients may go on in the future to needing what's called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, and I'll get more into the details of these shoulder arthroplasties in a second, but uh, reverse total shoulder is specifically designed for uh, rotator cuff insufficiency with arthritis. And uh, the real genius of this implant, it allows the deltoid to function as the rotator cuff would, and it's a great option for a patient with an otherwise difficult problem. So <clears throat> specific surgeries for shoulder range of motion loss, uh, of course, are tailored to the underlying problem. And some problems may be treated arthroscopically. This is generally what's thought of as minimally invasive surgery. Uh, we perform the surgery by putting cameras and in instruments through small incisions in the skin into the joint. Uh, rotator cuff repair is performed arthroscopically about 99% of the time. Uh, nerve decompression uh, can also be performed arthroscopically. And then uh, there are some arthroscopic procedures for shoulder arthritis uh, in the correctly indicated patient. Uh, this involves releasing the capsular tightness and removing the bone spurs that accompany arthritis. Uh, others require traditional open surgery and these would be the shoulder replacement variety. Uh, 
And um, in general, the workup is an x-ray with an MRI. Uh, x-rays, of course, allow us to see bone, but don't allow us to see soft tissue. Uh, and soft tissue around the shoulder is muscles and tendons. Uh, so uh, although we may see uh, diffuse arthritis on a uh, shoulder x-ray, we generally order an MRI to evaluate the integrity of the rotator cuff, as that helps a lot in surgical planning. Um, and then of course, if it's a, a, a run of the mill rotator cuff tear, an MRI facilitates our diagnosis after seeing in the office that there's weakness on exam or pain with uh, provocative testing. Um, <clears throat> so the arthroscopic treatment of shoulder arthritis. Uh, so this is again, minimally invasive. Uh, the goal here is to restore shoulder range of motion and relieve pain. Uh, generally, I reserve this for a younger patient with uh, arthritis that's resulting in loss of range of motion and who still has some amount of cartilage remaining on uh, both the glenoid and the humerus when uh, um, we get the MRI. The reason for this is if there's no cartilage remaining, uh, generally you're not going to see an outstanding improvement in pain as uh, the pain is being driven by the arthritis. Uh, if there is some remaining cartilage, uh, you can see great results here. We're just now seeing 10-year follow-ups on these patients uh, in a couple institutional studies. And uh, there's actually been a much lower rate of conversion to shoulder replacement than we had anticipated. Uh, so uh, this procedure, uh, at, in figure A, you can see a arthritic shoulder here with some remaining joint space. Uh, B is an intraoperative image uh, where we are actually using a chisel uh, minimally invasively to take off that bone spur right there. Uh, uh, the additional uh, black thing you can see there is our camera, which is looking at the uh, chisel, but we also use x-ray to make sure we're chipping away at that bone uh, around some of the corners that we can't always see with the camera. Uh, C shows the capsular release that we perform. The capsular of the shoulder is, as it sounds, a, a thick, fibrous surrounding uh, structure that, as we develop arthritis, thickens up further. And uh, whether it's performing this arthroscopically or performing it open with a replacement, we need to release in order to give a patient more motion. D is a finished result uh, with a much smaller osteophyte there. Osteophyte is a bone spur. And, um, uh, no large, uh, again, no large incision is made for this procedure. Uh, outcomes of this are not as durable as a shoulder replacement, meaning that you may have another surgery down the line, which would be a shoulder replacement if symptoms re return, which is pain, loss of range of motion, stiffness, or loss of function. Uh, shoulder replacement is generally performed for arthritic conditions. Arthritis can be due to a variety of reasons. It can be post-traumatic. Uh, it, it can be without a really obvious cause. Um, and uh, it can be due to inflammatory arthritis, such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, those sort of conditions. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this, again, is due to wearing out of that articular cartilage that you, you've heard people say bone on bone. Uh, you no longer have the smooth bearing surface of the joint. And as this is worn out, uh, you progressively have more pain and loss of range of motion. And fortunately, we have a great solution for this. It is removing the arthritic portion of the joint and replacing it with metal and plastic. Uh, so this is performed with a, a traditional open approach. That's not a super large incision, but it's an incision uh, over the front of the shoulder. Uh, we go down through an intramuscular interval. So this is a very uh, soft tissue friendly procedure that we are taking, we're going in between muscles in order to access the shoulder joint. Uh, then uh, the <clears throat> shoulder joint bony, uh, arthritic bone is removed with a combination of a couple different instruments that we use intraoperatively. And the humeral head is also removed. Uh, so the glenoid, which is the cup of the shoulder, 
is resurfaced and a plastic poly is placed into the shoulder. Uh, the humerus is replaced with a stem. So here I've got a little model of a, uh, th and this is for an anatomic shoulder replacement. So, and I'm hoping it's easy enough to see right there that if I take off the humerus, you can actually see this is our plastic poly right here on the glenoid side. This is the cup of the shoulder. Uh, so the normal arthritic bone is reamed away here. We get a nice smooth bone surface for this to heal to, and then the plastic poly is placed. On the humeral side, we, similar to the glenoid side, recreate the anatomy. We take off the humeral head with a saw and then replace with a metal uh, stem and ball. Uh, also, a resurfacing procedure can be performed, and that's where we generally perform this without a stem. Normally, that's in a slightly younger patient who may need a surgery in the future. And then the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, as I've alluded to, uh, it's really been a wonderful um, innovation that's come about in about the f past 15 years to America. That uh, before the reverse came about, we were doing shoulder fusions for people uh, with this uh, rotator cuff problem. Uh, so the difference between the two is that the reverse actually, as it sounds, reverses the shoulder. And something called a glenosphere is placed onto the um, uh, glenoid side. So the, actually a ball here is placed onto the glenoid side. So rather than having a cup like you do in the anatomic, you have a ball that's here on the glenoid side. And then on the humeral side, we have a stem similar to the anatomic, but the cuff is on the humeral side here. And so this allows the deltoid to function as the rotator cuff normally would, preventing what we call pseudo paralysis due to inability to raise the arm due to rotator cuff weakness. Um, hemiarthroplasty is a partial replacement of just the humeral side. That's rarely performed now that we have the reverse available and that we have excellent anatomic total shoulder implants. Uh, joint resurfacing, as I mentioned, is a slightly less, um, it, it preserves a little more bone uh, in case there's a future procedure, procedure needed on down the line. Uh, so I've really chosen to focus on uh, recovery after rotator cuff repair and um, shoulder replacement uh, here that uh, biceps itself is normally a pretty quick recovery if it's performed in isolation and doesn't add much to the recovery of these two procedures. Uh, so at rotator cuff repair, I think most people know somebody who's been through rotator cuff surgery and they probably had some uh, pointed things to say about the recovery period that it, it, it is a long recovery and uh, you know not the most pleasant therapy sessions in those recovery, but ultimately the outcomes are great and do allow us to get back to these high level activities like tennis, et cetera. Uh, so normally after a rotator cuff repair, you will be in a sling for six weeks. Uh, this is dependent on the size of the tear, maybe a little less, uh, but in general about six weeks. Uh, during this time period, physical therapists will work with you on regaining passive range of motion and what we call active assisted range of motion. That's A-A-R-O-M. That's using your own muscles with the facilitation of a therapist in order to get some muscular activation, but not putting too much stress across the repair. Uh, isometric strengthening is just when you flex your muscles without any weight or any movement, just simply flexing the muscle. At six weeks is when we start to really get moving with the uh, physical therapy. The sling is removed, active range of motion has begun, um, more restrictions are lifted, and light strengthening and endurance are performed. At uh, three months, uh, shoulder range of motion should be full. Uh, occasionally, somebody is slower in coming along on their range of motion, and this can still be worked through with PT, but if that's the case, we may talk about doing a little lysis of some scar tissue, just 
a, a simple procedure uh, in order to make sure that we're not getting a long-term stiffness. Uh, also should be back to most activities, but not yet back to high level activities at the three month time period. Uh, we begin strengthening for power at that time. Uh, six months is really when I expect a patient to come back and say, I'm really happy that we did this. Um, that I expect a full recovery, a return to high level sporting activity or whatever uh, functions that a patient does enjoy to do, uh, whether it's you know gardening, it, anything, but back to skiing, tennis, uh, shoulder dependent sports, swimming, et cetera, all those things. Uh, shoulder replacement recovery is a little quicker. Uh, that's because we're not relying as much on uh, actual healing to occur like we are with a repair that with a reconstructive procedure, which is what a shoulder replacement is, we're removing the diseased tissue and replacing it with something new. That's uh, what reconstruction is throughout the body. Uh, so, in general here, normally in a sling for about four weeks, uh, but can be six, uh, depending on if we have to do any associated rotator cuff tendon repair. Uh, working with PT in this time period and at six weeks, I expect a significant amount of motion to be back. Uh, <coughs> at six weeks, we expect to see a full uh, active range of motion or near full, uh, and re most restrictions are lifted at this time. Uh, light strengthening endurance is progressing to more aggressive strengthening endurance in this time period. And then at three months, range of motion should absolutely be full and should be back to almost all activities. Strengthening for power has become, or is, has begun, and uh, um, high, the return to higher level activities is also uh, encouraged. Um, so I, that's it for my PowerPoint presentation here this evening. Uh, I, I'd like to open it up for any questions, if it, uh, um, anybody has any at the moment. We do already have a few questions. Okay. So I don't know if you can pull them over here, but we have a question from Paul, Michael, and Carolyn. So Paul and Michael are right here. If you want to answer that one. Okay. Hey, Paul. So I, I just saw your question here. Uh, how much rotator cuff surgery can be avoided by aggressive and consistent PT? Uh, so uh, this is a little dependent upon the uh, source of the rotator cuff tear that, as I had kind of mentioned, if this is an acute tear, I, I wouldn't recommend forestalling surgery that the result is better going in early. But for most rotator cuff tears, which are degenerative tears, uh, patients will improve with physical therapy and may be able to avoid surgery. The best evidence we have says maybe about 50% of rotator cuff tears when treated non-operatively can avoid surgery. Um, you know, I'm a surgeon, so I'm always happy to operate, but first line is always conservative management with me that it's always better to avoid the knife if you can. And uh, Michael, I see your question here. Um, I had shoulder surgery on my right shoulder with Dr. Dorf two summers ago. I have in the past month experienced tingling and numbness in my right hand and arm for the past month. I have some pain when I twist my arm in a certain position. I'm hoping this is some type of strain that will disappear with time. Should I be concerned? Uh, so I, the tingling and numbness in your right arm and hand are a little concerning for me. I, I, I think it would warrant a visit. Um, that uh, in general, when we are seeing a lot of nerve symptoms, which is what that numbness and tingling normally is, it's frequently coming from the cervical spine. Um, and the cervical sp spine impingement can be due to the uh, spinal cord itself or to the little nerve roots that come off to our muscles. Uh, so I, I, I think I, I, I would come into the office uh, if, um, if I were you just to have this checked out. I, I think that this could, could be related to the shoulder surgery, but just off reading that, my mind in, it immediately jumps to maybe this is not really related to your shoulder and it's coming from the cervical spine. And uh, yes, uh, so Carolyn Tucker, I just saw your uh, question here. Uh, are, are there any strength and range of motion exercises one can do in preparation for rotator cuff surgery? Absolutely. Um, so in general, I think uh, TheraBand exercises are Excellent. If you've ever been to a physical therapist, 
Uh, they, you've seen the multicolored bands that they have, uh, which are like large rubber bands. Uh, the reason why this is a good intervention is this provides eccentric strengthening of the muscle. That's where the muscle is contracting, but also lengthening. So if you think of like a biceps curl, it's when you're letting go of the biceps curl. This has the best healing potential and the best hypertrophic potential, meaning muscle building potential for our muscles. So uh, I, I, I do think uh, therapy is helpful. I think TheraBands are very helpful. And then uh, our Academy's website, which our Academy is AAOS, that stands for American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And their website is orthoinfo, I believe it's aaos.orthoinfo.com, but if you just search AAOS orthoinfo rotator cuff therapy, they have a wonderful protocol that is uh, like a five page PDF on their website. We give to patients all the time in clinic because uh, it's evidence based, it's simple exercises, they have beautiful diagrams on there with clear instructions. And I think it's a great way to start kind of a home exercise therapy program for yourself. We have a few more questions. Okay. Um, Robert, I uh, just saw your question here. Has PRP shown any success for tears or tendonitis? Uh, the jury's still out um, that we have papers saying one way or the other. I, in general, uh, do think that it's a pretty good intervention. Uh, I think especially for a partial thickness tear uh, that it may be uh, potentially uh, encourage some healing there at the side of the tear that may result in tear uh, repair. Uh, for a full thickness tear, no. Uh, that at that point, there's been mechanical disassociation of the tendon from the humeral head. Whereas a partial thickness tear, it's still intact. It may be a little torn, but may be able to heal down since the remaining fibers are in place. That, you know, uh, injection will never bring that tendon back over to its home. Um, but Overall, yes, uh, PRP and its cousin, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which are uh, what we call like orthopedic stem cells, uh, do have some promising results, although I don't think they're a panacea. Uh, John, uh, so uh, for patient, uh, how are these processes complicated for patients using warfarin? Uh, we have a lot of patients who are on anticoagulants, whether it's warfarin, uh, an oxaparin, which is Lovenox, uh, even aspirin, which is you know a, a lower strength anticoagulant, uh, that uh, normally we will consult with your cardiologist or your primary care physician uh, that, of course, normally there's a reason you have a blood thinner. Uh, and in general, about five days off of the blood thinner before surgery is what we need. Uh, the potential complications are coming off the blood thinner. There can al there's always a risk of that, that if you're on warfarin, Normally they'll put you on a little heparin bridge uh, in order that you can stay anticoagulated close to the procedure. Uh, if you were anticoagulated going to a procedure, the risks are further bleeding. And then as you bleed, you know, that can create a strain on the heart. So that's why we avoid uh, anticoagulation as we do the procedures. Also for my own ease, it makes the procedure technically easier to perform because I can see better and do a better job. We have a few more questions. Let's go to Melissa and then we'll go to this one at the bottom and then we'll come to this anonymous user. Okay. Uh, hey, Melissa, uh, if there is pain from the neck down to the shoulder, could this possibly be a pinched nerve and require a visit? The pain is more like a burning in the shoulder. So it absolutely could be a pinched nerve uh, that the confounding thing is that when we have shoulder pathology or dysfunction, normally the trap muscle, which is the, you know, the thick shoulder muscle here wants to tighten up that it helps stabilize the scapula, which is the shoulder blade in the back. And when we see shoulders dysfunction, invariably there is increased tension across that trap muscle. And, you know, it's the same muscle that you have rubbed when you're getting a, a back massage from your partner or whatever, uh, that this sort of burning can be due to really that muscle firing. But at any time that I hear a burning coming down from the neck and radiating down the shoulder, I want to do an exam to really make sure that I can't provoke that uh, any further with neck range of motion that 
if you were to tell me, oh, when I'm driving my car and I look out my back seat when I'm reversing, it makes that worse. That to me points out, okay, there's some nerve impingement here. We need to go uh, down the road of getting a neck MRI uh, before we get a shoulder MRI. They can coexist, uh, but the most important thing is, although I'm an extremity surgeon, the most important thing is always to take care of the spine. Um, and oh, Wayne, I just saw your uh, uh, question here. Uh, so uh, I, I actually always recommend coming in to see me first. I'm happy to refer you to a PT. I don't think it's a bad idea to see a PT first that, you know, it saves you a doctor's visit. Uh, but I do think that you get a little more understanding of the pr problem. And even without advanced imaging, I generally am able to get a pretty good idea of what's going on with you uh, through a, a thorough history, just asking you about how this happened, what your symptoms are like, and a good physical exam. That uh, uh, That is the true essence of what I do is examining and narrowing in the possible diagnoses or the differential. Uh, and then we go to imaging. So I think that uh, coming in to see uh, me first, that I normally don't jump straight to imaging. Normally we start out with some of these other conservative things, unless I see something concerning on your exam. Uh, you go either way, but I'd probably recommend coming in to see me first and we refer you to PT. Um, and uh, I've got a question from uh, Anonymous here. Uh, I had some pain in my right shoulder for a bit a while ago, but apparently tore the entire biceps tendon in June. My pain has almost totally disappeared since then and my strength in the shoulder seems fine. I had surgery in my other shoulder a few years ago and know the tough rehab process. I'm not currently planning on surgery. I'm doing therapy for it. Any idea how long I can avoid the surgery? You may avoid the surgery indefinitely. Um, that uh, as I, I was kind of mentioning earlier uh, that one of the surgical procedures that is performed by some people for a biceps tendon pain is just cutting that tendon. So you've actually done that to yourself and we have a term for that, it's called an autotonotomy, just meaning that patient's biceps tendon ruptured and your symptoms are very classic actually, that I had pain before and I actually feel better after the biceps tendon ruptures. The deficits in strength are normally not too profound it's normally in endurance and cramping that we really see the differences. Although some patients do just fine. And uh, so I think in general, uh, you may avoid surgery indefinitely. The thing to kind of watch out for, I, I don't know how important cosmesis is to you, is this will go on to form a, um, asymmetric biceps that the muscle contracts down and that scars down in that position. And that is ultimately something we can't change after too much time um, progresses. So we got a few more questions. Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. And I, I see, uh, Fred, I have a 50% tear in right shoulder supraspinatus. Um, so I, I, it's difficult to um, uh, say exactly how I would manage that without having seen your images with my own eyes and kind of known a little more of the history. Uh, oh, I, sorry, I just saw the addition. I was diagnosed two years ago. I was told to have PT and I did for a bit. My shoulder is not that painful and I continue to swim surf regularly. Am I doing more damage by not having surgery? So uh, you, you've opened uh, Pandora's box there that uh, you, you may. Uh, that the natural progression of these rotator cuff tendon tears is that they do progress. Um, that, and they may progress to becoming, going from asymptomatic to symptomatic. Um, I think with a partial thickness tear, uh, normally I, I don't have too much concerns about this progressing to becoming an irreparable tear, which would be the real concern. As long as the tear is repairable, it can be repaired, you know, at time zero or at time two years. Uh, that um, I, I, I think symptoms should be your guide. And if you were seen by somebody who recommended physical therapy and you've been doing well since, that it's very reasonable to continue without surgery. Um, that said, there's a chance this tear is progressing and is doing so silently. Uh, the 
it, it, if you were uncertain, the next step would really be coming in to see us. We'd get an MRI to evaluate the tendon. But I don't really jump off, as I said earlier, I don't jump off the boat to operate on somebody just based on an MRI. I think that uh, symptoms and uh, loss of function and pain have to really line up with the MRI findings. So uh, sorry for kind of the equivocal answer here, uh, but answer is yes, the tear may be progressing, but also if you're not symptomatic, I, a lot of people live with partial thickness tears and have no issues and sounds like you're doing pretty well. Looks like we have a question from Kathy and from another one from Robert. Okay. And uh, Kathy, just reading your question here, I've been told I need a replacement. I have floaters and several bone spurs. Would an injection prolong use without replacement? I can't lift out to the side or straight up. I'm very active. Hate to give anything up. Uh, so I, I, the, and you may have been advised this when you saw somebody, the definitive procedure for you will be a shoulder replacement. It sounds to me like you may have rotator cuff arthropathy, although sometimes we see a inability to lift the shoulder uh, due to just freezing into the joint from arthritis where the rotator cuff is still intact. But either way, uh, the treatment would be either replacement with the anatomic shoulder or the reverse shoulder. Uh, the uh, injections can help quite a bit. Some people live many years just getting injections. And I'm just going to answer another question while I'm answering this one. Uh, I saw Robert ask, how many injections are you comfortable with and how often? Uh, so as to the injections, I generally, I will not inject more frequently than every three months. I, and that uh, comes from our academy, uh, as well as a wealth of research that if you're injecting more frequently than that, you may be causing damage to the cartilage within the shoulder or possibly some weakening of the soft tissues around the shoulder. Um, that said, I prefer it if we can do every six months, although every three months is not unreasonable. Um, and I honestly, the amount of injections rarely comes into play because arthritis is a progressive condition. And as arthritis progresses, normally the injections become less efficacious. So that, you know, you may get one injection the first year, two injections the next, and then three years of uh, four injections, something like that, with diminishing returns each time. Uh, so uh, to answer uh, both your questions and once here, uh, that uh, every three months, and I do think injections can definitely help arthritis, the shoulder is not a, a weight-bearing joint like the knee or the hip. So it's generally a little more forgiving and may respond a little better to some of these injections. Um, an injection should generally last about three months. Some people only get a month out of the injection and then, you know, have to kind of manage in other ways for the two months until they can get back in. That's generally a patient who ends up desiring a shoulder replacement as, you know, the main indications for a shoulder replacement are pain and loss of function. So uh, as you're noticing, okay, this isn't working for me and my function is just not what I want it to be that's when it's time to consider a shoulder replacement. The only additional caveat is you have to wait three months after an injection for a shoulder replacement, and that's just due to uh, decreasing the risk of infection after a steroid's put into the shoulder. I think that's all we have. Okay. All right. I think that's all of our questions, guys. I, I, I believe so. Uh, thank you all very much for coming in here today. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you all, and uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, if you feel like um, you have any shoulder issues that need some treatment.